Uh, so, thank you, uh, opportunity. Uh, you covered some of that about me. Uh, so, I've been working for Julie Computing for about uh, eight months now, nine months, ten months now. Uh, prior to that, I was a postdoc at UCL uh, and sort of working in MCMC. Uh, and if you're familiar with MCMC, it's a computational approach, but it's inherently a sequential algorithm uh, because you're building a Markov chain. So, you need to, each observation depends on the previous one. Um, and so you hit all these problems in, a, in MCMC, which is like basically it's not amenable to like the vectorization tricks you have to play with R to get make it reasonably fast. Um, so I started using that. I'd use Mat I started using MATLAB while I was there. Uh, and as anyone who's started using MATLAB, you quickly tire of it. Uh, and so I started. Uh, and so basically, I came across a blog post about Julia. So I thought I'd try it out. So it was September 2012, pre-version 0.1. Uh, so it was you still had to compile everything from source, and it worked fairly straightforward. So that wasn't that was the same problem. Uh, and then, of course, pre-version 0.1, it was quite easy to find bugs. Uh, it's getting harder, it's still possible. Uh, and so my first pull request was three weeks later. Uh, I think I fixed up the determinant. They were incorrectly calculating the log determinant or something uh, of a Kolesky factor. So I fixed that, uh, and then I sort of. My research went downhill ever since. Uh, uh, but the reason why I was sort of drawn to it, um, I'm one of those people who keeps like delving. Part of the problem is like one of those people who keep like delving into things and finding you know why it works and how it works and pulling things apart. Um, basically, it was very easy to write, very easy to write. Um, so to try out ideas and especially you know you don't have to worry about the C overhead of like C of like writing all the boilerplate that you necessarily have to use. Um, it's, it was fairly fast. Wasn't you know I wasn't really at the point. I was actually most of my research was really uh, working on theoretical type things, but you needed to write them up at the end. And so you wanted something that was fast, but also I wanted it to be fairly representative, the speed to be representative of the underlying algorithm, not of the my terrible implementation. Um, you know, so you wanted for the for loop to be roughly the same as any other for loop, not randomly slow just due to some work. Uh, and basically, the other thing is easy to understand because I'd you know, write code and then forget about it and then have to look at it a year later, six months, a year later, and then try and figure out what it did, uh, which is always nice. And then the thing that really gets, and it gets a lot of people actually, Julia, is the uh, ability to peek under the hood. Um, and so as soon as you start finding things, you start playing around with Julia, and then you start things like, you know, at code. Has everyone seen at code, the at code macros? Okay, so you start writing a function. Um, that's a good one. Uh, so you start going through all of the things that Julia actually does. What's an interesting function that does something more trivial? Uh, let's look at, uh, let's just do times. Uh, one times two. So what happens when you do one times two? Uh, it generates, so it's calling some function called mul float, and that tells you what the types are that, so this basically is the original Julia, sort of a proto Julia code with a bit of type annotations. And you go, okay, well, what's the next level down there? And then you go, okay, so after that, you come to think called, basically, this gets passed to the LVM. Has a go at it, and it gets passed. So this is what the lower level sort of LVM notation is. Um, so this is what the compiler itself is playing around with. So it plays around with this. Uh, it's called LVM Intermediate Representation, or IR. And so basically, you can think of it as like a sort of proto, as a pseudo assembler. That thing, but it's, it's much easier to read than the assembler. And then you can also keep going all the way down to the assembler. So at code native, one, two, and then, so yeah, get all the way down to here's my uh, null SD, which is the actual floating point register operation. Uh, so, you know, so for people who obviously isn't that incredible, but you can actually go all the way, you know, for when you're actually trying to find out what's actually happening with your functions, is you can actually keep delving, go right at each step what is actually happening. Uh, so that's my story. Um, I tr originally had nice, this is a Jupyter Notebook slides working, um, and then I promptly upgrade, thought I'd upgrade, I ran package.update, which then promptly broke, broke them, so hence you just have to put up with me scrolling through the notebooks. Um, I do have some stuff in graphics, but I think we went over it yesterday. Uh, so it's basically overview of PyPlot and um, Gadfly, but um, if you're familiar with that, um, I'll leave that for the time being. We can come back to that if we've got time or if you want to see it. Does anyone want to see plots again or are you, uh, you bored of those? Okay, so the 
Um, my contributions have been over the place. Uh, I did a fair bit of this. I've worked a bit on the stat stuff, probably not as much as I should have. There's more to, a lot more to be done. Um, and then just also some of the random numerical stuff that I sort of became a numerical analyst by accident. Uh, but that's, that's another story. Uh, so stats. Uh, so I'll give you a quick overview of the stats ecosystem. So um, Julia itself has very, very, very basic stats functions. So things like mean, vote, covariance, correlations, etc., are all in the... Um, the very basic bits are included in uh, base Julia. Uh, and so if you actually need anything beyond that, you end up sort of delving into the uh, Julia stats ecosystem. Uh, and so the first one, which is basically dependent of every dependent sort of package of every other one, is this package called stats base. Uh, and it basically has all those the ne extra things that you need to do when you're sort of playing around with uh, sort of the basic summary stats, sum uh, computing summary statistics. Uh, so it includes like all the things like weighted functions. Um, and so there's W mean, W sum, W quantile, W median. Uh, but it also includes what this is actually a bunch of neater ways, this weight vec type. So basically it's a wrapper type around an array, uh, and then you just feed that as an argument into everything else. So you can do, uh, uh, so you can do something like uh, x equals around in 10, and then we'll create some weights. So W equals round 10 as well. And then we'll go, so there's W mean, which is X and you pass weights. Whoop, oh there, see, it's there. It's appreciated. Or you can use mean, weak back, W. And it's kind of nice, because you just overload it's this thing that Jay, I was talking about the overloading the uh, generic functions. We just, mean, we just stick an extra argument on there. And then you, so mean is a function from base, but then we just add this extra method to it. Uh, which lets you compute weighted uh, weighted means. Uh, and so, and it's nice then is that you can then reuse the weight, same weight vector across multiple uh, functions. So it's, a, it's a very convenient notation. Uh, so then, uh, so, yeah, so things like histograms are also included there. Although histogram in the sense of it gives you an object which represents a histogram. Um, this, and so this needs to get hooked in nicely with the plots functionality once, at some point. But We'll get done and sampling without replacement and all yeah, so resampling and sampling without replacement, all those sort of core things that you sort of play around with when you need to do basic stats stuff. Uh, my favorite stats package actually is this one, distributions. Uh, actually my second favorite, my favorite one I'll talk to you about in a minute. Um, so distributions is actually one of the I think it's like the fifth package that came with Julia that Julia. That's including example.jl. So example.jl was the first, I think, and then distributions was the fifth. Um, so it's actually really old. Um, and it's got some, and it's actually what I think is one of the nicest things about, so it really showcases what Julia, the strengths of Julia. Um, so again, load it using distributions. Um, so uh, distribution is an object. Um, so D equals, so this one is just creating a distribution, a gamma distribution. Um, and so why it's nice, I don't know if you've ever used like R, R or things, you basically have these bunch of functions like R gamma, D gamma, P gamma. So you have to remember what the difference between T gamma and the P gamma and D gamma is. I always kept forgetting. I always forget. Um, and so this just creates a gamma distribution. You don't, um, and then you can just then feed this into the mean and so again, mean and variance of the functions are base. We just add new methods to them that take distributions and give you the mean and variance of the distribution. That's quite nice. Uh, and then this PDF function, which computes the PDF, the density function of a distribution at different points. Uh, which works quite nicely. Um, and so it's worth saying that the reason actually this works, so there's actually a, if you delve into the why this actually works. So well, I mean, you could do this really in most languages. So, um, you know, there's no reason in any sort of object-oriented language you could build this class, you know, distributions class, and then you could add these methods. Um, but what makes it particularly nice and fast in Julia is the fact that how these, these uh, things are defined as, distributions are defined as immutable types. Um, and why immutable types are nice is that by the time the compiler gets to it, it basically all it sees is a tuple of numbers. So um, it, there's essentially no overhead to creating. So usually the problem in the, most languages, if you did try to do something like this, you have this huge overhead of every time you constructed a new distribution. Um, so especially in something like MCMC, where you're always creating new distributions at every iteration, you have you have this huge overhead of creating and destroying just these objects. But in Julia, because of the, how these are, types are constructed, they're very essentially incredibly lightweight into the sense of where 
in most cases, the compiler will be able to optimize them away and just see them as a to, as a pair of numbers, which you know can get treated as any other sets of numbers. Will, will. Um, yeah, and then so from then on, we can do things like you know, digression, things like ran, random numbers from different distributions. Are, you know, we just overload the rand function, and then you feed in the distributions an argument. Uh, so you can also see nice things. Uh, so gadfly, I've, I would have talked about, but you've seen. So, uh, so you sort of easily compute distributions. I won't do that. It's fairly obvious. So computing the PDF versus the um, density estimator of the distribution. Uh, and there's also some basic estimation functionality. So things like uh, fit. So you can feed. Uh, the, so this time we've got some data X, which was the sample data, and then you're fitting a gamma by a maximum likelihood. And this gives you then a gamma distribution back. So you, we're passing this hype gamma as a, an argument, and then we get a, a, a distribution, a fitted distribution back. So it was a three alpha three, and the original premise were alpha equals three and theta equals two, so they're quite close. And you can see how the difference this is the plot of the difference. So the red one here, so the green one is the fitted, and the red one is the red one's the original, and the green one's the fitted, and the blue is the density estimator. So that sort of shows you how all these things play together. Uh, so there's quite a, there's a huge number of univariate distributions, um, and then from on built on that is the multivariate, and there's also the multivariate distributions uh, and also some matrix distributions. So a multivariate distribution, uh, for example, a uh, mean no, uh, normal, a multivariate normal distribution. Uh, so okay, multivariate normal with a unit diagonal does that, uh, and how this actually implemented is quite nice, and so it optimizes. Basically, when you construct a multivariate normal, it does all tries to make it as efficient as possible. So when you construct the multivariate normal, it computes the Kolesky factor and stores that. So when you have to, so basically every operation you want to do on a multivariate normal distribution, you need a Kolesky factor, um, and so it computes the Kolesky factor. And then from then on, when you do the random sampling, the Kolesky factor is all computed, so pre-computed, so it can just do um, do the fast you know compute um, you know, standard normals and then multiply by the Kolesky factor. Uh, and then same with PDFs, you want to solve by the Kolesky factor, and then, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can, when you, uh, because it's a multivariate distribution, if you say more samples, it gives you a, the columns of the observations and then get an array back. And of course you can do fitting, et cetera. Uh, and then you keep building on that. So there's a mixture model, which is essentially, um, so basically a mixture model is then a parametric type, which takes in an array of distributions and an array of weights, and gives you a another and gives you a, a mixture model distribution. Um, and so here I've constructed a mixture of um, two normal two normals, and um, and the weight 0 0.7, 0 0.3, and then you look at the PDF and it looks something like this. So yeah, this all works nicely together. And the things and so also we can I think we can also do uh, let's do this work. So and you can also then uh, you know, do rand. So sample, samples from it. Yeah, so you can also sample from a mixture, and then you can um, you know, plot, uh, compute the PDFs and those sort of things. I don't know if CDFs work for mixtures. I think they're a bit more complicated because of the weighted thing. But uh, okay, so let's play. Distribution is actually very elegant. I think it's one of the really nice things about working with Julia, and so that's the something I've actually spent a fair bit of time with. Um, data frames is sort of the so basically, if you've ever start sort of the standard uh, way of implementing with a Julia, like data, so sort of tabular data in Julia. So by tabular data, I mean sort of your standard, the sort of the two properties are the, well, it's two-dimensional, so you have columns and rows. Um, typically, the column, almost always your columns are heterogeneous types, so you might have columns of ints, columns of strings, etc. cetera. Uh, and then, but your rows are all the same, uh, homogeneous, so each row is the same, of the, you know, particular rows are the same. Uh, and there's also sometimes missing, uh, optional missingness, so you might have missing values. Uh, and so data frames has been, I think, one of the, again, one of the more oldest packages as well. Um, and it's sort of, although it's fairly fast when compared with something like R, it does have a few performance, inherent performance limitations. Um, so sort of showing its age despite not being that old. Uh, so it probably will be sort of, it's one of these things that needs a bit of a redesign. And so, but for most, so in most cases it works quite well, but. As soon as you start really pushing it to quite large sizes, you can notice some there's some severe performance uh, performance problems there. Uh, but how it works? So um, 
using data frames. So you can provide, uh, there's a couple of ways you can construct them. The one easy way is just passing in uh, columns as uh, keyword arguments. And so this could be column one, column two. Um, and so each column here is now what's called a data array, which is essentially a type of array with an optional missingness. So you can have <laughs> NA values. Um, and the other thing nice thing about data is you can actually just stick any Julia object in there. So you can stick, make a column of distributions here, for example. Um, but yeah, you can also stick, if you have an image type, you can just stick images in there, whatever. Just throw it in. It'll work. You can create a data frame of data frames. Have a column of data frames. Not that I recommend doing that, but it'll, it'll work. Um, and so there's one way. Um, if you want to load the standard data set, this is our data sets package, which just has all the, someone's gone through and just like stripped out all the data sets that get bundled with R. End up doing there, so that's quite a so that's a way to get your standard iris data set. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit more later about the uh, sort of other ways to actually read in data if you know you don't want to look at the iris data set. You know, if you actually have real data. Uh, <laughs> and so how it works, uh, so iris indexing, uh, so indexing, so if you index by a symbol, so remember a symbol is this thing indexed by a, by a colon, a prefixed by a colon, then you get the column. So that uh, is fairly straightforward. So Gives you a column of sepal length. Uh, if you index by uh, a number fo co followed by a colon, so two argument, so colon just mean uh, when you just have a single column by itself, it's, it basically means take the whole. So it's so it's standard x y indexing, but colon means take take the whole slice of that index. So we're taking uh, row one of uh, sorry yeah row one take all the columns. So row one take all uh, blah, 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 blah. row one take all the columns. Um, and then you can also subset by indexing. So here we're uh, indexing, so each where the sepal length is less than five, uh, then we take the we take all the uh, columns. Notice you have to use the dot less than here. That's because what you do is, um, so the operators, Julia operators are inherent uh, scalars. So you can only less than, well, you really should only less than two scalar objects. If you want to uh, take the, less than of two vec compare two vectors element wise you use the dot thing so we sort of stole that from MATLAB and made it somewhat more consistent so uh, that's one of the so it's and sort of as time goes on we're sort of more and more getting rid of the idea that you can just automatically just vectorize a function you have to so for example I think that one of the changes in point five now is that rather than saying take sign the uh, sign of a vector for example and give you the element wise sign you have to use sign dot of a vector sort of to enforce the fact that you know the sign it really operates on a scalar, and then there's a vectorized function, and you map that over a vector to get the vectorized form back. And they've got this elegant dot notation, which is sort of coming, coming about. Uh, yeah, so that. Um, and then it also supports this split apply combine strategy, which Jihao mentioned. Uh, and so the idea is that you sort of basically, so you have the data set. Um, and then this by function essentially teaches, uh, you say you group, so by is essentially this group by thing where it splits it out into groups split by species. And then for each one of those, you then compute the mean. Um, and we, you apply some function. And so in this case, we're uh, applying an anonymous function which maps the, computes the mean of the, mean of the petal length column for each of those groups. And so that will give you the sort of classic uh, split apply combine. And one of the things it does is it works very nice with the Gadfly. So, uh, uh, so Gadfly is like similar to this, G is similar to, very similar to ggplot2 in R, if you've used it, uh, which is hardly we come libraries. And what's particularly nice about it is that, um, but we fix the stupid thing we overload plus to mean something, which obviously isn't, isn't addition. So, uh, so rather than that, it's you just feed things as arguments. So plot, uh, we data set, and then the arguments. So there's a couple of ways Gadfly works, but one is the, so the arguments are the, uh, what do you call the, attribu uh, the attributes. And so uh, x is your, you have the x uh, axis, the y axis is the separate length, and then the color axis is the species. And then it gives you a nice plot, the standard iris plot of you know, the three clusters of the different species. Uh, and then yeah, you can do GM density plots as well. Uh, so there's a few other ones. Um, so they're sort of the most developed ones. There's then from then on you sort of go into the more specific packages, which can be of varying quality. Uh, so glm.gl is also quite an old one. Uh, and works you know, is basically fitting uh, so linear regression, so least squares linear regression, and then also generalized linear models, so your logistics and Poisson's and those sort of things. 
Uh, so using GLM, uh, we steals the sort of R style uh, formula syntax. So basically, you have your left left hand side is the uh, response variable, and the right hand side are the uh, are the co covariates, co um, and then it uh, will then build the sort of appropriate model table. So uh, the appropriate uh, model matrix, and then do the least and do the appropriate regression. Um, and that gives us our thing. Uh, we can do also do sort of generalized linear models. So here we're now fitting a generalized linear model uh, with the Poisson, uh, Poissons, and that gives you the model back as well. Uh, and then once you've got the coefficients, there's a predict function. So if you just uh, predict, so G, so what, you, what it gives you back is this fit object, which is essentially uh, acts like a um, stores the, all the coefficients and a few things of the uh, model. And then predict G will just give you the sort of the predicted values back for the original. Um, on the original data set, or you can feed in an optional argument as well to, predict, to apply this, or those predictions to new data sets. So that makes it all very easy to use. Uh, there's a couple other ones. Kernel density is a nice little one as well for fitting kernel density estimators. So there's some kernel density estimator stuff built into Gadfly. Well, actually, Gadfly calls this, uh, but there's no way to actually access that from Gadfly, access the actual numeric values from Gadfly. So kernel density is essentially the um, the plots the, is the underlying does the underlying uh, kernel density estimation, and so if we can construct kernel density objects, um, and then the nice thing about it is that you can actually feed in uh, so using kernel density the, uh, and then you, you know, there's our uh, PDF uh, and you get the PDF of the kernel density estimate. So the kernel density est kernel density est gives you this KDE object, and then we just overload use this PDF function from the distributions to you can just feed in K, uh, use a kernel density object object into PDF to get the, um, the PDF, to get the values back, the PDF. Uh, and the nice thing about KDE is you can actually just, it also takes, uh, the kernel is just a distribution, so you can just change that to, say, uh, instead of that we can use like a Cauchy kernel. Actually, no, we can't use Cauchy because it's never, that's too heavy-tailed. Uh, we have a, uh, do, 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 I think, a logistic works. See that works. No, uh, maybe if we provide. Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> Sorry, I wrote this package a while back, but I can't remember the actual form of arguments. But basically, you can feed in uh, arbitrary different kernels quite easily, um, just to distribute, just passing distributions to act as the kernels, and then the, also it'll adaptively choose the kernel width. Or there's various ways to choose the kernel width. So there's a either by sort of rough heuristic or least squares uh, cross validation is another way to do it. Um, Various other things, mixed effects models. So mixed models is a, if you ever have to work with mixed effects models, uh, then the mixed models package is actually fantastic. This so it's written by Doug Bates, who wrote the LME and uh, all of our LME four and all the ones in R, and then got fed up with trying to maintain it, uh, and so he rewrote it, implemented all in Julia, um, and so this is his pet project. Uh, penal various penalized regression, GLM net and Lasso do things like Lasso L one and L two penalization. Um, I think the Julia implementation is actually a fair bit faster than GLM net, the Fortran, original Fortran code, for some reason. I'm not sure why. Uh, there's actually a few various MCMC packages. Uh, there's Clara.jl, Stan, which is an interface to Stan, uh, the Stan package. There's also, oh, there's a Mamba, or I think it's Mamba or something like that. There's another one. And possibly the stupidest name package is findsl.jl for fast and furious statistical modeling is this. <laughs> I haven't tried it myself, but... It looked uh, quite a, it's a very clever name. And uh, there's a couple of deep learning libraries, like, which was well, MXNet, I think, is sort of the classic, is the sort of recommended one at the moment. I think it's basically just a wrap around the, C, the, um, the library. I mean, deep learning stuff, you really do need GPU, some GPU functionality for anything beyond any non trivial. So uh, that's, Julia does still is a work, the uh, GPU story is still a, good, is a bit of a work in progress. Uh, your time. Okay. Um, I'll give you a quick thing about calling other programs from Julia. Uh, so I don't know, once you've start, it's actually calling other programs from Julia is actually, despite, you know, we talk about the two language problem and you only need one language, but sometimes you do need another language. Uh, mostly because you have this existing library or something you want to use. Um, and so actually calling stuff from Julia is actually very easy. Uh, so although you probably won't have to do it that often, if you ever have to wrap an existing library, there's the C call in Julia is actually basic, so it's very easy to call like existing C libraries from Julia. Um, so basically, it's this function called C call, which just takes the 
Um, so here I'm just calling the standard C power function, which computes the power of a, two, of a floating point number. So um, pow is the name of the function. libm is the library, because it comes in the C math library. Um, C double is the output type, which is actually a float64, an alias for a float64. And then you have your two input types, and then you just pass the arguments. Um, and that should, and that just gives me a thousand back. So it's quite easy to do that. And so it's very easy to, and then you use this to wrap existing libraries or, so if you have a, like a standard library or something, a library you have to use for your work, it's very straightforward to do. Um, and then on top of that, it's actually combined with things like macros for generating these, that, you know, if you've got 10,000 functions, you don't want to have to go through and write them all by hand. So you can have macros which sort of generate, the, generate these quite easily. Um, and then there's also a lot of interfaces to other, um, to other software. And so our call is something I've worked on fairly well. Um, and so this is, I actually rewrote this fairly recently. So it's actually, well, myself and a few others, uh, Randy is the other major contributor and Doug Bates, I think, started with it. Uh, it was sort of kicked this off. So uh, basically, you'll need R installed. It doesn't install R by default. So if you have R installed, it should detect where it is. In, so use in package.add R call and using R call. And it starts up in our session in the background somewhere. Um, and then what we, the main interface is this string macro. Uh, so Julia has, basically if you have a string in Julia and you prefix it with a, uh, some sort of symbol, in this case R, it does something special. It becomes what's called a non-standard non string literal or a macro string literal, which basically <laughs> means at compile time, it, does some, it can do something funny with it. Uh, and so in this case, uh, at compile time, it runs the, calls the R parser, and then does a few tricks, and then um, gives you, returns back you a, a call to, the, to execute some R code. And so then when you run it, it actually exec then executes the R code. Um, anyway, so basically prefix your string with R, and then that runs that in R, and then gives you the answer back. And it gives you the answer back wrapped in this R object, which is essentially just a wrapper around an R object, as you hope. So it's stored. So the object is stored in R, and there's just a wrap, a pointer, a reference to it in Julia. Um, and then we can just convert that. If you want to get that back to a Julia object, you just use R copy, which gives you back the sort of canonical Julia representation of that object. So it does it has a few heuristics for figuring out if it's a vector or a single element or a matrix or whatever. Um, so that's great. You can call some R code and do that. What's nice is you can then just pass Julia. There's a uh, we, there's a bit of a hack here that, that works. You can actually pass Julia objects to R. So we can call, so we have a Julia vector, oops, sorry, two Julia vectors, x uh, and then, uh, which is zero to two pi, and sine of that value, uh, and then we run plot. And so basically, if you've ever used R, there's the dollar, um, basically dollar is used for like indexing into a vector by name. Uh, but whenever that isn't valid syntax, so whenever it's not valid R syntax, we use dollar as a, you can use dollar for variable substitution for Julia. And the nice thing is that there's very rarely, there's basically no cases where you would want to do one where they would both be valid, valid cases where you would want to do them. So there's basically no overlap of where you would use them. So we can actually get away with this. So here we're calling plot on two Julia, um, two Julia object, the R plot function on two Julia objects, and we get the plotted vector back. So this is again calling the R plot function on two Julia vectors and then giving you the plot back into Julia. Well, into, in this case, the iPython notebook, Jupyter notebook. OK, um, so that works for vectors. Um, but both Julia and R, in both Julia and R, functions are themselves objects. So we can also pass functions backwards and forwards. <laughs> so in this case, now we can also pass the Julia sine pi function and plot that. So this is a plot in R of the Julia. So it's calling the Julia sine pi function in R to then plot that. And we can also go the other way. Um, and this is where you start finding really, uh, I don't know, you ever, R has a lot of quirks. And this is the craziest one. One of the craziest ones by far is non-standard evaluation. Um, and so in R, that's how it gets nice. Um, when you do plot x, y, it gives you nice variable um, labels on your, vec on your axes with the uh, variable names. Uh, unfortunately, this, Julia is very much standard in its evaluation, so I can't do these sort of tricks. And so here I'm loading, R plot is now a, uh, Basically, we just call the plot. So plot in R is just an object, a function object. Mm -hmm. So we get R plot, which is a, now a Julia, this R object wrapper around the Julia, Julia, uh, thing function. And we can call that in Julia, and it gives you this mess back. <laughs> so basically, because R doesn't know what the Julia variable names are, because 
R doesn't let, because Julia doesn't let functions know what the variable names are because that's a stupid thing to do. It makes your programming impossible to reason about or compile or do anything. Um, yeah, you get this sort of crazy behavior. So you have to be, it's not quite as uh, flexible, but it does. Uh, yeah. So basically, the problem is R, Julia, R doesn't know about the access label, so it just fits, uses the actual data, which is not that nice. So. Um, and now let's get crazy. Uh, so here we have a factorial function written in the possibly the worst possible way. So we have j factorial, which calls r factorial, and r factorial, which calls j factorial. Um, and then that all works nicely. So basically your factorial works nested down alternately calling uh, j factorial and r factorial. And that should work as it works. Uh, and then j factorial works as well. So, so you can do quite crazy things here. Um, there is a chance you may lose a lot of memory if you keep doing this. I think I've fixed most of the memory leaks, but occasionally, because I have to keep track of the garbage collector in both languages, you might end up with circular references. Um, anyway, I'll stop doing that. R data sets. Uh, so, okay, we'll load an R data set. Um, so this is the Iris data set I loaded before, um, Iris. And then we can just uh, load the R ggplot2 library and then pass the, so basically R data frames are automatically converted back to Julia, uh, sorry, Julia data frames automatically converted back to R data frames. So, we plug the iris here, so this is the Julia data frame in pass back to R, and then we get the same plot I had earlier, but with uh, but in ggplot2. Um, yeah, so basically you can be, it's very convenient for, basically if you need functions from R, you just load up R call, and then you can pass Julia objects straight into them and get the things you need back. Um, and so I'm going to make this, working on trying to make this extensible at the moment so that other packages, um, so especially like a lot of the biology stuff is a, like bio, there's like the huge bioconductor stuff in R. So you want to be able to make them so you can pass, you, know, you have your specific object, which you want to then be able to use uh, interop with uh, Julia and R. So, we, uh, so trying to make this more wrapper friendly. Uh, and there's a lot of other similar interfaces. There's Python, there's PyCore, which is actually one of the older ones. Um, and that's how Jupyter works as well. And the PyPlots works. Uh, Matplot, there's Matplot, uh, Matlab.jl, which is basically a very cheap program. Matlab. C plus CXX.jl is a very nice uh, sort of very experimental, experimental interface to C plus plus. So if anyone's calling C plus plus from any other language is basically is incredibly painful, and this should make it much easier because we can just leverage the same compiler. Uh, and, time. and Java, Java call is essentially just the uh, also works quite well. Um, so I think I'd give a said I'd give a quick overview. Yep, a Fortran. Um, no, there is, however, there's a bit of code for. Um, so oh, you can call Fortran. So if you've got a for compiled Fortran code. You can just call. Um, you can call Fortran from by the SQL interface actually. So if you've got a compiled Fortran library, uh, you can use the SQL interface. You just have to stick some underscores in appropriate places. Um, and use pointer, so because everything in Fortran is passed by reference, so you have to use pointers. You can't pass C doubles, you have to pass pointer C doubles. Um, but if you want to see how to do it, uh, look in the, because uh, look in the laypack and blas, look in the source, Julia, saw, um, Julia base, laypack and blas, because they're all Fortran libraries, and how they do it, and, or post on the message list. Um, there's, because I think every Fortran compiler has its own intricate way of doing it, so it's a bit compiler specific. Um, there is also some code which translates Fortran 77 to Julia. Though it's incredibly painful. Though. So that's how we, uh, someone's translated all the special functions um, libraries basically by just running. So because Fortran syntax is very similar to Julia, it basically just kind of does an automatic translation then. But I wouldn't use that on a sort of, without checking the output first. Uh, anyway. uh, CSV, uh, so just quick thing on reading writing data. Sorry, I won't take too long. This is a fairly short bit. I had a few requests for this. Uh, so how to get data in and out. So um, comma separated values are unfortunately fairly ubiquitous. Uh, so there's a few, sort of three main ways to do it um, in Julia at the moment. There's read CSV in base Julia, um, and you basically only want to use this if you've got a matrix. Um, so hetero, entirely homogeneous data, because otherwise you get an array, you get this matrix back of random types. Uh, in data frames, is read table, which works mostly, uh, although it can get a bit slow once you get quite large. Um, basically, just because you had data frames designed. And then csv.jl is sort of this latest edition, and it's quite fast, and it's based around this idea of streaming data, but every time I use it, they've changed the interface, so I would, you sort of have to read up 
play around with it a bit. Um, hopefully that'll settle down in the near future. But uh, it's certainly, if you've got huge CSV files, that's the thing you need to use at the moment. So there's lots of other ways. Uh, JSON, this JSON.jl is fairly good for serializing and data to and from JSON. Uh, and there's a bunch of, if you've got other custom data format files, there's basically a lot of ways to do this. Um, if you do have to save and store data between Julia sessions or between computers, J there's this JLD package, which I recommend. Uh, and it's basically backed by this HDF, sort of very standard HDF5 format. So you can actually, most of the case, even open it in other programs. Um, turns out that's what MAT files in MATLAB are. Well, any recent version of MATLAB is these MAT files. Um, and so you can also load them quite easily. And there's a package for loading R data, you know, R data files from R. You can obviously load them by R call, or you can, there's this R data uh, package which will makes it easy to load and save them directly without having to load R call. Um, if you've got any images, so there's actually a lot of ways to load images into, some very easy ways to load images. Um, there's also, I should mention, file.io.jl, which is great because you just, it sort of automatically just looks at the header of the file and the file name and tries to guess what the, f um, what the appropriate package is and then loads that. So you don't need, a lot of the times you don't even have to actually figure out what type of data you have, it'll just figure it out and uh, load it itself. Um, and then, especially images data, so things like every, any raster image format, so PNGs, bitmaps, JPEGs, et cetera, you can load them directly into Julia's matrices or colored matrices or whatever, matrices of colors or matrices of floats, et cetera. Uh, databases, finally, it's a bit of a mix. Um, look in, there's this Julia DB organization, so if you look under there, you'll find they have basically the current things. Uh, some of them are fair, quality varies a bit though. Uh, though sort of ODBC is like the low level one works fairly well. So if you need to use that, that's the sort of fallback. Um, and okay, that's all I finish up there. Thanks, Simon. Um, do, we've probably got a bit of time for questions. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, <laughs> that, that's probably a whole talk in itself, if not more. Uh, there's the, for simple, depending on what you want to do, so the, there's the standard um, end pro, like starting up new pro, multiple processes, works reasonably, not too bad. Um, so there's the app parallel macro, have you seen that? Um, maybe Jared, you're actually better answering this one. Yeah, so I've been exploring really this like parallel to map out what we have and do not have uh, recently, because we're thinking about uh, reapproaching some of the earlier designs we had. But currently, what we have uh, in base is uh, a paradigm for distributed uh, computing that's mainly master slave, and there's some all to all uh, experimental functionality in there as well. Um, but really, I think the, the value of Julia for parallel computing is that we have a, a bunch of wrappers for a bunch of different parallel paradigms. So we have like an MPI wrapper, a ZMQ wrapper. Um, I wouldn't say that these wrappers are necessarily complete. They're mainly whenever anybody like happened to need a piece of functionality, they would they would add it. Um, but in the future, I, th I think there will be work put towards actually making them uh, more more complete um, for, for end users. So yeah, so, so I would say that uh, Julia's base parallel model will get you by for a lot of things. I wrote, uh, a server which which runs every day um, uh, using Julia's base parallel model, um, and it works. Uh, but if you're doing something like high performance distributed linear algebra, um, and you happen to know that you your cluster has like really fast interconnects or something, you might need to use our MPI wrapper to be able to take advantage.